Well, how about the Gilgo Beach, Long Island serial killer case? One day after they had, they had a description of this man. They had a description of his very unique vehicle. Someone who had an interaction one day before one of the victims went missing. And an eyewitness who actually saw this guy and described him and his car. And it's not like, oh yeah, you know, average height. Av no, not, at, not anything but average. Like huge Frankenstein uh, sized guy. And a very unusual vehicle as well, a Chevy Avalanche. How many of those are there out in Long Island and Massapequa? Not a ton. And that was one of the pieces of evidence that they, they looked at after all these years when they got like people together. And, and that's how they end up putting the pieces together with information that they had like 13 years ago. What's going on here? Well, we're gonna dive into the problems with this investigation and why it was delayed for all these years this hour with some people who know a lot about what was going on in terms of law enforcement, politics, everything out in Long Island. This case should have been solved a long, long time ago, from, in my opinion. So let's, let's begin, though, with the latest in this case, in the investigation. And there's been a lot of focus on, on the house of the accused killer. And we're getting some images now of what's going on in the yard. Look at that. You see the yellow excavator? scooping dirt in the backyard on Sunday. I'm still at the house today. Um, you can see from some of this drone footage what is going on there. Like, it's an obvious place to look, right? The guy lived here for years and years and years. You're gonna get rid of evidence, maybe you get rid of it. They're dismantling a, a deck area. Um, they're scanning. Are they gonna find anything? What would you expect to find? How do you, how do you go through the earth to find stuff without destroying evidence as well? Um, this is an investigation where, yeah, they have some evidence now, but you always want more because it's always going to be challenged, especially, especially in a high profile case like this. But this is where a lot of the focus is now. So let's start there and talk about what's happening at the house. Joining us tonight in New York City, senior reporter uh, from the U.S. Sun, Luke Kenton, back with us. And in Jacksonville, Alabama, forensic death investigator, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, and the host of the very popular Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan with us. <laughs> Great to see you both. Um, so, Luke, what are you hearing about the, the search uh, of the property uh, out there in Massapequa? Yeah, there's been a been a great deal of uh, police presence at the home since uh, Rex Human's arrest on on July 13th. Uh, over the last few days, that search seems to have intensified somewhat. We've had uh, cadaver dogs present in the yard of the home. They've deployed uh, sonar devices to uh, to look down into the ground, and also, you know, you've you've seen heavy machinery there digging up um, and excavating the earth around the property. I think particularly the existence of, of canines and, and, and sonar is, is an interesting uh, development that seems to me to signal that perhaps police are, uh, are looking for human remains on the property and, and perhaps there, there are additional um, victims that we're not yet privy to buried somewhere on that yard. Uh, additionally, you know, they'll be looking for, for other items of evidence, perhaps murder weapons, uh, buried trophies, one of uh, Rex's neighbors came forward last week and said uh, during his time living next to Rex, um, around the time of the murders, he'd hear digging in the backyard at, at strange hours of the night uh, and, and, and strange times of the morning as well. So that certainly seems to be something uh, police are following up on. And we know that they're working with the theory that perhaps Rex lured some of these victims to his home and, and murdered at least one of the women there. So Joseph Scott Morgan, the last time we were looking at a, a huge excavation in a backyard, it was Chad Daybell out in Idaho. We know they found mm -hmm. um, significant evidence there, tragic but significant right. evidence. Um, what are your thoughts about what's going on in the yard and the property there? Well, they, they certainly have things set up, set up very similar, actually, to the way Idaho was set up. Uh, you, you see multiple sites that they're taking this evidence to. There's one shot that our producers uh, showed just a second ago, this tinted 
area. It's a covered area. And, and yeah, there you go. Um, that area that you would see them working in, just imagine each one of those buckets that comes up with earth in it is taken to that area and it will be sifted through, uh, like you see on an archeological dig many times, sifted through looking for any kind of fragmented bone or any kind of items that might be in there. You can find jewelry, you can find all kinds of things. However, what's very striking about this, Vin, is the fact that this is a very blunt tool that they're using. Uh, I don't know what can be inferred by that, but uh, it's covering a lot of ground at one time. They're taking out big scoops. Uh, it's not like a traditional archaeological dig where you have the area kind of gridded off into particular areas where you're working each individual grid. They're taking up big gobs of earth at that point in time. So uh, it will it'll be very interesting to see how this kind of plays out. Another shot that you guys are showing right there if we can hold that for a moment you see those cellar doors and that's very intriguing to me as well because that's out of sight we've got a lot of vegetation in the backyard so you're not going to be able to appreciate what might be going on on the, on the other side of the hedgerow however now with drone technology you can see all kinds of things absolutely now something else that a lot of people were talking about is what's going on inside the house you know, did he have like this room, which was just his room where no one else was allowed? And then rumors that it may have been a soundproof room in the basement of the home. Here's Rodney Harrison, who's been uh, pretty forthcoming throughout uh, this uh, part of the investigation with information. He's a Suffolk County police commissioner. Here's what he had to say about um, the rumors of the soundproof room. All right, Luke, what do we know about what was found in that basement? We heard uh, the commissioner there talk about a vault. Yeah, the, uh, the confusion between the soundproof room actually came from a neighbor late last week who, was, who said that it, they were told by a police officer on the scene that the soundproof room had been, had been discovered. That information was slightly misconstrued. What it actually is, is a walk-in vault in the basement, which we did know a little bit about before. In that vault, uh, Rex Heumann was, was storing somewhere between 200 to 300 firearms, which is certainly a very uh, excessive amount. Uh, around 90 of those he had a, had a permit for, but the rest seemed to be unaccounted for at this time. Beyond that, we don't actually know what else was found in the basement, but authorities did say that the search of the home, including that vault area, has been very fruitful so far. So I'm sure we'll find out more information about that in the coming days and weeks. Um, but I also think, you know, it's, it is important to highlight that number of firearms, you know, 200 to 300 is a huge amount. And um, I was speaking to some criminal profilers over the last few days who said, you know, that number paints Rex Heumann as, as, as maybe an obsessive individual and certainly maybe even a paranoid one as well. We know in the days and weeks leading up to his arrest, he was researching this case, you know, why some of the searches were, why haven't the uh, the Long Island serial killer been found yet? Um, why weren't they able to trace his cause? And I suppose that begs the question, do you know, was he paranoid that the net was finally closing in on him? Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, what are your thoughts about searching that basement, the vault, all the guns, and how that could or potentially be connected to this investigation? And would you expect to find anything else hidden inside that home? Well, certainly we know that in past cases where there have been serial perpetrators, one of the things that they enjoy doing is collecting trophies. And these can be anything from jewelry to items of clothing to actually anatomical elements that they will return to and kind of fantasize over. But I think a word of caution here, Vin, it's very, uh, it, it should be, and this was pointed out, and I'm glad that Will brought this up, it was alleged to be a soundproof room. There, there's a big rush among the media to want to turn this guy into Gacy at this point in time. You can't throw around terms like soundproof room and have that out there. You're talking about a, acoustic paneling. You're talking about specific kinds of carpeting. All these kinds of things can be inferred by that simple comment. There's enough on these guys' plate 
to have to process at this point in time. And the fact that he's got this many weapons down there, and Lord knows what else, I think that what you should be keying in on is what was mentioned. They're saying that this was fruitful. And from an investigative standpoint, when I hear that, and to continue on with that analogy, I like to think about this as harvest time. Uh, where you're going to try to collect as many fruits as you possibly can of your labor uh, down there in your searches. And the fact that they're saying it is fruitful is key because they have elements that could potentially have tiebacks. Remember, one of these other comments that's floating around in the media is that it is believed that one individual may have been killed in that home. And again, I think that that's what we need to be focusing on and not thinking about soundproof rooms and those sorts of things at this point in time. So, Luke, what ha, have we gotten any information about anything that's been retrieved from that home? And do we know about any other potential search areas out there? So with regards to the evidence that's, that's been found in the home uh, on Long Island, police have been quite guarded about that information. What we do know is from images that we've seen of them carrying certain items out of the home. So uh, we know they towed away um, a, another Chevrolet Avalanche belonging to them, a newer model, not the original one that was at a property in South Carolina. Uh, they've also carried out various items of furniture, uh, you know, sofas and, and, and lamps. Um, one, one item that I think drew particular interest and, and speculation in, in equal measure was uh, some, some sort of strange life-size doll that was encased uh, in a glass case um, that was taken out of the home a few days into the search. Um, the suggestion and, and, and the, 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 the speculation surrounding that doll is, you know, was this one of the dolls that was that was placed actually at a memorial site for some of the women uh, when their remains were found? Again, that's just pure speculation at this point, and police haven't commented on that. But beyond the house on Long Island, you know, Rex had properties in Las Vegas, uh, two timeshare properties, one of which he still believed to own, and also uh, uh, several plots of land in South Carolina, which are also being searched in addition to two storage units that we also believe uh, belong to Rex Hume. And so, you know, authorities in, in now multiple places across the country uh, have, a, have, a, have a, a large job on their hand. Um, again, they're being guarded about what they've found, but I think, you know, the fact that they're calling the search so far fruitful is, is, a, is a good sign for this investigation. Joseph, how do you know when the search is over? You don't, and that's what I've said consistently. Uh, Vin, uh, about this particular scene. This is this is the apex of everything, his home. Uh, they need to hang on to this thing. Uh, I'm of the opinion, and so are some of my colleagues out there, that they need to leave the place. Um, they need to leave, leave the place intact as much as they can and examine it down to the studs, Vin. Take everything out. Uh, drywall, the whole nine yards, because you don't know, you don't know if there are places that are hidden and sequestered in there. And I think back to BTK, and he had rat holed a bunch of items in his home, if I'm not mistaken. I know somebody will uh, gig me for this, but I think it was underneath a staircase or something like that. Again, going back to these locations to fantasize about these things. And you, you never know, uh, you might have those elements there. And you want to, the, the, the issue is you need to be able to keep this all in context, Finn, uh, for the overall scene. So when they're documenting this thing, they're looking at it, they can always get an idea spatially of where the stuff was oriented from Jump Street. And Luke, so far he's been implicated for three murders. Uh, any update on the fourth that we were expecting perhaps some sort of connection? Yeah, it feels like, um, you know, authority, uh, authorities have been very confident in the fact that they think they can file charges fairly soon. I think it is a matter of time before those charges are filed. And we haven't had any sort of indication about when authorities are going to move on that. But we also know in, in, in the last few days that it's not only um, on Gilgo that the, the police are looking at, at Rex for potential murders in Las Vegas. Uh, authorities over there said they're they're coming through cold cases to see if there's any potential link. Uh, we know law enforcement agencies across New York and even in New Jersey are looking at Rex. Um, and in New Jersey, there's a there's a spree of, of um, murders just outside of Atlantic City uh, in the mid 2000s that they're they're also you know going over with a fine tooth comb again. Um, so I think the scale of this search um, and the direction 
of the investigation at the moment kind of indicates that police think there are potentially more victims. Uh, again, speaking to some of the experts that I've spoken to over the last few days, you know, if, if indeed this guy is a serial killer, you don't wake up at the age of 46, murder four women, and then just stop. I think they're going to be looking, you know, in the years preceding these murders and the years after and, and make sure no stone is left unturned. Uh, what does your gut tell you, uh, Joseph, about where you think this ends up? Short of him um, confessing to anything, right? And saying, okay, yeah, this, this, that, and the other one. No. Just on straight up investigating, um, do you think they'll be able to get enough evidence to implicate him in any more murders? And what does your gut tell you about how far this could go? Well, it could go uh, extend out great. Now, I don't want to bury the lead here. I know that you have other people coming on this evening, but from a political standpoint, it is important that the feds stay at the lead here, Vin, because we've got all of these sites. Uh, we're thinking about potentially around Atlantic City. I don't know about Vegas, perhaps, down in the Carolinas. And I've been involved in a couple of serial, uh, serial killer task force over the course of my career, and you need that concentric control because you don't know what the left hand and the right hand are doing. And God bless the families of these poor victims. But I think this is just a start. One of the things you're gonna be looking for is to try to find patterns in their behavior. And one of the big hurdles that they're gonna to have to overcome then is, um, is the decay relative to the remains, trying to determine a specific cause of death in all of these victims. Is there anything that you can tie this individual back to from a physical evidence standpoint? Joseph Scott Morgan, Luke Kenton, um, thank you so much. Valuable information. Uh, we always appreciate when you come on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ben. All right, folks, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the issue that I started the show with. Why did this take so long? What was going on out in Long Island with law enforcement? Um, why? Why couldn't they put things together? Uh, we'll try to get to the bottom of that. Plus, coming up next hour. Big breaking news in Hoover, Alabama. Carly Russell called 911 saying there was a toddler in diapers wandering down the side of a highway. Then Carly disappeared. Then a massive search. When Carly reappeared, she said she had been abducted. Was it all a hoax? Tonight, finally, the truth. There was no kidnapping on Thursday, July 9th, 13th, 2023. My client did not see a baby on the side of the road. My client did not leave the Hoover area, which she was identified as a missing person. They were high school sweethearts reunited. Now he's accused of shooting her husband, and she's serving a life sentence. Jennifer Faith pleaded guilty to orchestrating the murder of her husband. Dark eyes is coming toward me. The alleged gunman, a military veteran who suffered a traumatic brain injury. A case of greed and manipulation. The Boyfriend Hitman Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Tuesday morning at 8, 7 central on Court TV. That individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6, uh, a, a large man thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally uh, big person with glasses, white, uh, and, and dark hair. Uh, also of significance was um, that the fact that he was driving a dark colored black uh, av uh, uh, first uh, a first-generation uh, Chevrolet Avalanche with a, a, a very uh, unique feature that was between the, the it's a pickup truck, so it was between the cab and the bed, uh, and that was identified. Again, that was back uh, in uh, 2010. Back in 2010. All the way back in 2010. Suspect in his car described. This is someone who, according to the witness, had interaction a uh, very violent interaction, scary interaction with one of the victims uh, the day before she went missing, right? A, a hot lead, but somehow got buried for 13 years. Take a look. In the winter of 2010, shortly after police discovered the remains of his 
of his roommate and three other women buried on a remote stretch of Long Island, Dave Schaller provided detectives with a description of the person he believed to be the killer. The man they were looking for was a towering, Frankenstein-like figure with an empty gaze who drove a first-generation Chevy Avalanche. They say Chrysler here, that's a, that's a mistake. It's a Chevy Avalanche. Uh, Schaller recalled telling investigators the man's size stuck out as he did his usual as did his unusual pickup truck, which he used to flee the house that Schaller shared with Amber Costello, one of the victims. On that night, Schaller said he came home to find the stranger threatening Costello, an occasional sex worker who had locked herself in the bathroom. The two men came to blows with the hulking intruder eventually leaving in the trunk. Uh, prosecutors say Costello was last seen alive on September 2nd, 2010, as she left her home to meet that same client. A witness saw a dark-colored truck drive by the house again shortly after she left. In the application to deny bail, based upon interviews, that client was described as a large white male, approximately 6'4 to 6'6, in his mid-40s with dark, bushy hair, big oval-style 70s-type eyeglasses. A uh, witness described him to police as appearing like an ogre. Uh, furthermore, the witness noticed a first-generation Chevy Avalanche parked in the driveway of the residence. That's a hot lead. How did he get buried? What, what was going on out in Long Island? Let me bring in my guest to help us try to figure that out. Former New York State Senator uh, Phil Boyle is with us. Also joining us from uh, Long Island, New York, former District Attorney and Police Commissioner of Suffolk County, uh, Tim Sinney is with us. Uh, thank you both for being here. I really do appreciate it. Um, let, me, let me start with you, Phil, from your perspective. Like, what, there was a lot of controversy, and I've been covering this before these these arrests, and there was always this talk that something something was just wrong out there. What was it? I think it was the police chief at the time. Uh, if you think back, Benny, uh, in 2011, we had a newly elected county executive, Steve Ballone. For some reason, he names this guy Jimmy Burke as his police chief. Burke had a long history as a police officer, and it wasn't a good one. Uh, he had... Uh, drug problems, DUIs, uh, he was caught having sex in his police car with a sex worker while not securing his gun. This is a guy who should have never been on the police force, forget about being made the police chief. The first thing that Burke does, because the feds were looking at him for other crimes, uh, was kick the FBI out of the Gilgo Beach investigation. Everybody knows you need the FBI and their forensic capabilities in a case like a serial killer, uh, but for some reason, Burke kicked him out, uh, and that is one of the reasons they didn't catch him with uh, even with evidence of newly found evidence of the person with the description like this. We never even heard it till the other day till it came out. I think if that was made public that there was a six foot four guy from Massapequa with a uh, Chevy Avalanche, they would have caught him a week later. Yeah, I, I, I haven't been to Massapequa recently, but uh, I, I, it's, you know, six foot four, six, six with that particular vehicle. Timothy, what, what was going on there from your perspective? What what was going wrong in this investigation? Well, I think Phil certainly hits a valid point. Uh, so, uh, for example, when my team came in at the very end of 2015, uh, the department was certainly uh, in turmoil. But if you go back, all the way back to 2010, you know, this investigation uh, started off on the wrong foot. You had a police commissioner and district attorney fighting about different theories uh, about the uh, about the murders. Uh, and then, of course, as Phil just mentioned, uh, you had uh, a chief of department, James Burke, and the former uh, district attorney, Tom Spoda, actively obstruct the FBI from assisting. You know, one of the first uh, reports that I saw was a report uh, issued by a detective saying that they were, they were told not to share information with the, with the FBI. There's, there's also other evidence not, not gathered and, and, and properly analyzed. Uh, and uh, those those uh, missteps certainly, uh, I believe, uh, hurt the investigation at an early stage. And and Phil, I remember in my coverage of this, uh, with these rumors out there, and you've got a, a police commissioner who's got problems, and and it's in a sexual manner, and you've got escorts who are found as the victims here. Um, for years, everyone is believing that the police themselves were involved here. 
Oh, that was a big rumor around here for a long time. And it was the police chief uh, that involved with Burke. Right. Uh, he, there was parties, parties over by the beach where near where these victims were ultimately found that had sex workers and drugs and evidently some police officers were there. So uh, it's been thought of as a police cover up for a long time. We did have corruption at the highest levels our, of our police department. Our Suffolk police force is great, uh, but the leadership at the time particularly was a disaster. So, uh, Tim, when you get in there and you've got all these rumors circulating and all these problems, how difficult was it to try to just get some semblance of order and trying to put together what would be a traditional investigation for a serial killer? Sure. So one of the first steps we took was to re-engage the FBI and seek out their assistance uh, at the time. The Long Island office uh, was run by uh, Geraldine Hart. She was the, uh, the FBI supervisor in charge of that entire office. She was a resident agent in charge. And then uh, when I left the police department, uh, she was actually brought into the police department by the county executive to serve as police commissioner. Uh, so certainly involving the FBI was an important uh, development. We also sought uh, the assistance of not just the FBI, but of the Nassau County Police Department. I want to really uh, thank my partners at the time in the Nassau County Police Department. Uh, as uh, been reported, uh, certainly Massapequa was on the radar as early as 2012, uh, yet there wasn't, um, there wasn't much work done in connection with developing that area. So one of the first things we did, uh, in addition to engaging the FBI, was to reach out to the Nassau County Police Department to do intel worksheets on all the residences that could potentially fall within the geographic area uh, where the killer resided. Uh, and uh, they were able to produce uh, very helpful uh, information with respect uh, uh, to, the, to that area. We also sought additional cell site information in the form of tower dumps. And then we invested about a quarter of a million dollars in, in cell phone analytics that help us pinpoint uh, the areas that the killer was connected to, both in uh, Massapequa Park as well as Manhattan. Uh, and I have to tell you, I'm, I, when I heard the, ner the news of the, the arrest, uh, the, the hair in the back of my, my neck stood up. Uh, I'm so proud of uh, the police department and the DA's office and watching right now the searches in Massapequa Park. They're going to carefully comb through all those areas, all the different relevant areas. Uh, and now, uh, you know, it's a matter of uh, finding additional answers. Uh, I, I expect Maureen uh, Brendan Barnes's uh, murder will be charged in short order. Um, and as I, I believe one of your earlier guests noted, one of the biggest issues is we always feared uh, that he was, uh, the killer was killing somewhere else because you have these uh, murders from 2007 to 2010, and then we don't have something consistent uh, in that area. So did he just stop killing? Uh, we potentially, uh, was he incarcerated? Now we know that's not true. Uh, did he, was he killing somewhere else? And so those are some of the answers that you're going to see answered by the thorough investigation being conducted now by local law enforcement. And, you know, I think it was a very astute point uh, by one of your former guests that now that you're talking about mul multiple jurisdictions out, you know, multiple states, uh, it's important to, to involve, uh, not just involve, but ensure that there's coordination. And certainly the FBI would be an appropriate agency to do that. Absolutely. I mean, cases like this is when, when you have all, everyone working together in step, not saying, keep, keep the FBI away from this. We don't want them. What? That that's, makes no sense. Okay, our guests will stay with us. Uh, we've got more to talk about in this investigation into the uh, suspected Long Island serial killer. We'll be right back. These are the cases that captivated the world. And keep my life straight. That demanded our attention. They were killed by their own children. That challenged the legal system and ourselves. How in the world can a mother wait 30 days for reporting her child missing? These are the trials that became legendary. Don't play! Oh, and now you can relive them all in one place. Court TV Legendary Trials. Go to courttv.com slash legendary trials to find out how to watch. Well, there isn't any doubt any longer that James Burke covered up when he was uh, in charge of this investigation. He covered up the uh, work in the investigation. 
and deliberately drove the FBI out of the picture, said they couldn't come in, drove out other police departments, such as the Nassau County Police Department, where two of the bodies were found in that county uh, along Ocean Parkway, and basically shut down the entire investigation for several months at a crucial time during the investigation. So he's connected to the cover-up, and in what other ways, I guess we're going to hopefully find out sooner or later. So let's find out a little bit more about James Burke and exactly what the whole situation was about and is there a connection to the killings or is all of this some sort of really bizarre coincidence? He became the police chief in 2011, became the focus of an FBI investigation stemming from an incident in 2012 when he attacked a thief, Christopher Labe, after he broke into his squad car and stole a duffel bag containing pornography and sex toys. Burke attacked Loeb at the police station. He then orchestrated a failed cover-up when Loeb complained about the beating and the FBI investigated Burke and Suffolk County. At the same time, there was a probe into the Gilgo Beach murders, and to cover his own tracks, Burke removed FBI agents from the case. Burke did plead guilty, you've seen the video, in 2016 to conspiracy to commit obstruction of justice and violating the victim's civil rights for beating up the guy who stole his duffel bag, 46 months in prison. Let's bring back in our guests, uh, still with me, former New York State Senator Phil Boyle and former District Attorney and former Police Commissioner of Suffolk County, uh, Tim Sinney. So uh, I don't, generally I don't believe in coincidences, but Tim, you, you know a lot more about this than I do. Do you believe it was a, a coincidence that somehow the chief Burke was into like pornography and sex toys and got caught up in something connected to that at the same time that there's an ongoing investigation by his department into the deaths of sex workers? Well, look, certainly you know, I'm still, even though I'm out of office now, I'm not able to talk about any information that remains confidential uh, in the investigation. Uh, I do have complete confidence that uh, if there is any information that connects James Burke to uh, the sex trade on Long Island or elsewhere, that, that, will, that will come out. We have uh, certainly, um, we've had several police administrations since he's been in office. Uh, there has been certainly no, uh, no incentive to uh, cover for James Burke. Uh, and uh, I also think that, um, you know, as people come forward in connection with uh, this investigation, uh, if there's any connection to any sort of, um, you know, uh, patroning of, of prostitutes in that area, uh, that's a potential avenue where, where it will come from. Now, in terms of, you know, covering up the investigation, um, you know, it is true that he uh, obstructed the investigation in that he blocked the FBI. It's also true that, uh, in my opinion, uh, he sided with the district attorney's office in terms of not expanding their attempts to seek relevant evidence, uh, particularly in the form of cell, uh, cell phone evidence. Uh, it is, I also agree that uh, he did not involve the Nassau County Police Department to the extent that they should have been uh, involved. Uh, and so instead of theorizing as to what his motives were, uh, I'm only able to, to state those facts. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Phil, uh, from your perspective, right, uh, and for the people uh, of, of Long Island, I mean, there's still this cloud. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, what the public is going to perceive from this? Because you still have the case, um, you know, this three people, there have been uh, charges against the suspected killer for three of the victims, they think it'll be a fourth, but there's still a lot of bodies out there, including Shannon Gilbert, who was the first uh, woman that was sort of became the focus of this investigation. They were looking for her when they found everyone else. So what are your thoughts? So first of all, Vinny, the, the, regarding the cover-up, do I think that James Burke was purposely covering up for a serial killer? No. However, uh, he was against the federal law enforcement agents. He wanted them out. And you think about it, what, what a terrible confluence of events we had. We had a police chief, a crooked police chief, and a crooked district attorney. You, to, you talked about uh, the, the beating of Christopher Loeb, that they covered up for three or four years 
uh, before finally uh, both uh, Burke, Jimmy Burke, the police chief, and the district attorney, and the district attorney's top aide, Chris McPartland, all were arrested. Burke has went to federal prison, and Spoda and McPartland are, are still in prison, federal prison because of a cover-up. Needless to say, uh, looking into this Gilgo Beach thing with, uh, case was the la last thing on their minds. They were worried about what was going on with them and some of the corruption in their in their department as well. So it's unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Sini talks about uh, the phone records. They had these phone records from day one. As you mentioned, they had the, the description of the guy, the car. They had all the information they needed almost from day one. Uh, thankfully, we have a superstar new district attorney, uh, Ray Tierney, who brought it all together, created this task force with Rodney Harrison, our new police commissioner, and it, it happened. And I can tell you that if Burke had not been arrested and, and sent to jail, he probably, Steve Ballone would probably still have him there as his police chief, and the case would have never been solved. Uh, 10 years later, 11 years later, uh, we'd still be looking for uh, this Gilgo Beach serial killer. Uh, and Timothy Sini, what are your thoughts about the rest of the cases, the rest of the victims, um, do you think yeah, there so will be arrests connected to their deaths as well, their murders? I think it's, I, I do believe that you'll see a charge in short order with respect to Maureen Braden Barnes. Uh, and then of course the, the other uh, homicides and uh, the other victims that were found in that, in that stretch of, of area by on Ocean Parkway um, will remain open. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, obviously important that those cases uh, are continued, uh, you know, that they continue to work those cases. And I know that they will. Um, you know, it's, you know, certainly uh, the focus uh, of this case against, um, uh, against the defendant, against Rex Schumann, uh, is focused on the Gilgo Four at this point in time. Timothy Saney, former uh, DA, police commissioner, um, really appreciate uh, you coming on tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Phil Boyle, a former New York State Senator, thank you both. Um, and and um, we'll see how all of this uh, ends up, hopefully, with solved cases and some convictions.